The virtual CISO moment is brought to you by VCISO Services, a leading provider of quality and experienced virtual chief information security officers for small and mid-sized businesses. Check them out at vcisoservices.com. Hi, I'm Greg Schaefer, and welcome to the virtual CISO moment. We're here with Keith Mowney. He is the founder and COO of Acumen Technology. Keith, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Greg. So I know we've known each other for some time, and I know part of your backstory, but I'd like to hear how you originally got into IT and cybersecurity, uh, what drove you into it, and uh, the, the the passion, the whatever your motivators were, and how you got to the point of founding or being uh, Acumen. Uh Gosh, I, I don't want to give you my, the whole life story, but it goes back pretty far. Um, we got my family got our first computer back in the, I guess it was late '80s, early '90s, maybe uh, when I was in grade school. And uh, I guess like a lot of kids, I I figured out how to load up games on it. You know, even playing games on it back then, though, was kind of required some technical skill to like you know copy these things off the floppy disk and load them up and uh, set all your you know, settings right on the computer. So, um, but I also found, uh, I discovered like basic on the computer and uh, I really took a liking to figure out how to program the computer to do little things. I programmed to play tic-tac-toe and all this and 10 like, print hello, 20 go to 10. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, exactly. And, uh, and it goes from there. Yeah. You start yeah. with that and, and kind of build from that anyway. Um, so always liked it. Um, as I got into high school, I actually put an ad on a BBS um, but just to dial up, I was the, the national exchange, uh, just a little dial up BBS and, uh, put an ad for doing web page design. And I was contacted by, uh, two folks. One of them, um, was where I met Sonny Clark, uh, who is my still now business partner, um, some 25 years later. So, um, anyway, I, after high school, I ended up, um, uh, ended up joining up with Sonny at advanced mm -hmm. network solutions um and uh kind of a it consulting company that evolved into an msp as the industry kind of changed and uh we ended up selling advanced network solutions in 2011 uh took a five-year break from it um went to business school law school flew an airplane did all sorts of things and then uh ended up deciding to get back into it in 2016 uh with acumen technology and um and then here we are. <laughs> so a little, a little condensed there, but, but that's the whole history. All I just, just always loved it as a little kid, I guess. I, I, I think that there's part of that story. I didn't know you say that you flew an airplane. What yeah. Is that? I, I, uh, I, um, uh, so as a little kid, I remember I was up in Ohio. I remember driving by uh, the airport at Kent state university, always just fascinated by the little airplanes flying around, mm -hmm. uh, much later in life when, um, I had the financial means and the time towards the end um, at, at Advanced Network Solutions. Um, I got got to where I had enough time to take off to go take flying lessons. Uh, I got my pilot's license. And then after we sold Advanced Network Solutions, I bought a, a Cirrus SR-22. Mm. Uh, and I had so many adventures flying around with that. Um, sadly, now I haven't flown in a while. It's one of those things that you have to have enough time to do often enough to stay proficient. Um, and I've got two young kids now and haven't had the time, but yeah, it was a blast. Well, and, uh, and part of the reason why I bring it up is that I owned a Cessna 172 and used to fly a lot. And I think I remember us talking about that yeah, a little bit in yeah. the past. Um, and one of the things that I've always seen that translates well from flying to um, cyber, particularly in information security, is is the risk management aspect of it. Because in flying... We always we always say that it's not one thing that causes a crash; it's the last thing, right? Yeah. So there's this series of cascading failures where you're not managing risk correctly, and a lot of times in cyber, um, that's the same thing too. You might have like the layered controls in place, but it's the failure of all of those, and then getting to the last one, which causes it to uh, actually become an issue. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. That's a good parallel. The accident chain. Right. They call it the chain of events and, and the chain of failures uh, that leads up to the accident. Flying is just like the chain of, you know, security layers that has to be broken or go wrong to have an incident. Uh, yeah, it's a good analogy. I, I, I know we've had um, discussions on the podcast before about how 
there seems to be a lot of military folks in, in some ways that are that are in um, cybersecurity because of almost the same sort of risk management mentality. So anyway, I just thought that that was an interesting uh, uh, side note there. But but great history coming all the way through. And you actually you you uh, went to law school, too, as part of your 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 training, right? As part of your education. I, I did. That's another interest. I always I, I did forensics back in grade school and, and debate. And uh, always, always loved, you know, just debating both sides of an issue and, and kind of the logical uh, side of it. And um, it's funny, you know, I found like contracts are kind of like programming in a way. You have terms that you define, kind of like you define variables, and then you, you know, reference these terms throughout the contract and you try to write it very precisely in a way, you know, that uh, I, I know people probably don't feel it ends up that way. They're oftentimes end up confusing and that people can't understand, which is a failure of the intent of the contract. The contract is supposed to make things as clear and laid out as possible. Mm -hmm. where there's no room for misinterpretation, just like you need to get a program very precisely written where you capture all possible scenarios and, you, and you've coded for every possibility. So um, I found a lot of parallels between the logic of uh, even like the Boolean logic of like in a contract, you, the difference between saying if this happens versus only if this happens um, you know, the, the necessary condition versus the sufficient and, and all this. Anyway, it, uh, it it parallels the Boolean logic of programming very much. That's fascinating. So what, um, what uh, can you give us a little snippet of like what a typical client for Acumen technology is? Uh, well, we work with a lot of regulated businesses. Uh, so we have big verticals with uh, financial services clients like community banks and credit unions and then healthcare as well. Um, nowadays, I mean, just as we're here to talk about, um, a, a huge part of IT is security. And uh, we work with these regulated businesses that have a big demand uh, to be secure. And all different sizes of business or, or more on the smaller side? or yeah, The smaller side. Our clients um, generally range from 20 seats to a few hundred. Um, okay. We do go pretty far up market because we do a lot of co-managed clients. Uh, some MSPs kind of focus on the ones that they can fully manage. Uh, and we uh, find that oftentimes with the community banks, they'll have some amount of in-house IT. So we find ways to, to tailor the agreements and co-manage, uh, you know, taking over certain aspects and letting the in-house folks, you know, do their thing. Uh, so we'll tend to work with some larger clients that do have some in-house IT as well. Well, I'm, I'm interested to hear your perspective on this because you, you, you bring a, a rather unique set of skills to, to what you do in addition to just growing up, if you will, in IT. That's the term I use for myself yeah. um, as well. But uh, being a pilot and having the law degree and the MBA and all of that, plus working with, um, we'll, we'll look at small and mid-sized businesses at this point in time, particularly in the regulated industries. What would you say from, from that unique perspective is uh, one of the most significant threats for cybersecurity for small and mid-sized businesses today? Um, I mean, it's got to be ransomware. I mean, th but that's the, the threats are how, you know, how you get the ransomware is a lot of different vectors. But um, but overall, the overall thing is ransomware. Um, I mean, at this point in time, if there's some sort of denial of service vulnerability, we're like, ah, oh, no big deal. You know, what's the worst that happens? You know, denial of service, I'll take it. Um, right. You know, compared to ransomware, you know, years ago, uh, you know, when we were worried about, you know, protecting networks and, and you know, putting the firewalls in place and, and the antivirus software, worst case scenario is you're getting pop-up ads, right? A virus gets through, a worm gets through, and you're either spreading emails that just spread for the sake of spreading, just for, you know, fun or something of, of whoever wrote it, um, just to kind of prove they could do it, or you're getting pop-up ads. That was how they monetized it, right? They they got little, you know, the, they got the, uh, you know, malware on the computer, which generated the ads. But ransomware, I mean, just changed the game. Now the stakes are so much higher. You have, you know, and, we, and, you know, back then it used to get through. Stuff used to get through and you cleaned up computers. You got rid of the adware. No big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you know, one thing gets through and, and it's a huge deal. So the stakes are so much higher, you know, where it's like you have to be at zero. You have to have zero ransomware get through. You need enough layers where, you know, nothing at all is getting through. So it's tricky. Then you talked about, uh, let me see if I remember the terminology correctly when we were talking about flying and risk management. Was that the, the failure chain or the fail chain? Yeah, well, in flying, you the accident chain, but, but accident yeah, chain. yeah, yeah. In, in cybersecurity, I guess I'd call it the, the the chain of failures, yeah. 
So let's think about ransomware for a moment because, a lot, well, first of all, ransomware has evolved in some ways where it used to be about, well, I'm going to encrypt your information and then pay us the ransom and we'll give you the decryption key and everybody's happy. Um, now, since people have realized that they can, if they have great backups, that that's not going to be a threat to them, they've pivoted towards being more about extortion, about releasing the information. Either way, ransomware, I would agree, is a hugely significant threat out there. But let's think about the uh, the failure chain. Um, a lot of people are, are are focused on the fact that credential reuse would be one, right? Yeah. Um, lack of multi-factor would be another one, I would think. Yeah, absolutely. But, but even lack of multi-factor now, um, there are there's a new threat out there, well, quasi new, called uh, MFA fatigue. And um, which you're probably you may have dealt with with some of your clients. And so now we're at a, at a point where where we thought that we sort of had a silver bullet against ransomware and, and any sort of like credential attack. It's like, well, just use MFA and you're fine. Um, you know, don't do SMS, do something a little bit more robust. But now we're we're that can be exploited. So I'm wondering, and this is just sort of like a stream of consciousness thought, what other controls to provide layer security in the failure chain might help to reduce that threat a little bit. Any ideas? Yeah, that's a good question. So more and more nowadays, it's additional layers inside the network. Um, you know, so it's the whole zero trust philosophy that like even within the network, more and more layers because assuming that, yeah, maybe it does get in. So, I mean, first of all, on the endpoint EDR, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a must have nowadays, like something is going to get into that endpoint and EDR needs to lock it down fast before it can spread um, or application whitelisting. So, you know, we're trying to make EDR a must have across all of our clients. And we also use another uh, zero trust agent that does application whitelisting and uh, privilege elevation, like dynamic privilege elevation. So you can keep users, you know, as, as normal lockdown users, but still have the power uh, for us centrally to allow, you know, temporary administrative rights for this update to run or something like that. So previously, you know, application whitelisting turns turns like antivirus are on its head, right? You know, normal antivirus software is, you know, allow by default with this blacklist. And EDR kind of builds on that. It's still allowed by default with not just a static blacklist of what's not allowed, but a little bit more, you know, dynamic of recognizing behaviors that shouldn't be allowed, but still a allow by default kind of philosophy. You know, application whitelisting, it's denied by default, except for these signatures. They used to be hard to manage because we're constantly putting new patches and updates and keeping up with those signatures to properly allow those things was difficult. But the software is evolving where it's getting easier to do that and uh, allowing those, you know, approved things to run with appropriate administrative credentials so it can install, uh, but then, uh, you know, not allowing that malware in. So, you know, that's super important. Um, principle of least privilege on the network. I mean, the days of letting people just have like, allow everyone open to the shared drive and, and things like that. I mean, it's super important. Like, even if that computer does get taken over, the EDR doesn't stop it, making sure that ransomware can't spread on the network too far beyond that. It, you know, it should only be what that normal user had access to, uh, which might be pretty bad, but it shouldn't be encrypting your whole network and your backups and all that. Um, so, you know, keeping things patched, because a lot of times, uh, you know, these attacks, you know, the malware is getting in, there's some process that's running as domain admin, running on that computer, there's some bug that allows it to like pull those credentials out of memory, get in the context of that admin, and then start spreading on the network. So, but ultimately, there's some bug that wasn't patched to, to allow that to happen. So keeping those endpoints patched. Um, but Anyway, yeah. And, and then the firewall. The firewall should be stopping these downloads as well if it's filtering all that. So lots of additional layers beyond just the MFA, because you're right. I mean, there's ways to get around that, unfortunately. Well, and I appreciate the the detail there, because one of the things that we found, and you've probably seen this as well, too, is that uh, I was actually just speaking with a colleague actually earlier this morning uh, who is in IT and was somewhat frustrated about some of the controls that they have in place to limit access that they usually had beforehand. And it makes his job a little bit harder and all that. But I think in general that there can be some friction among small and mid-sized business 
just general employees is like, why is security wanting us to do this? Why are they wanting to do us to do that? And the more that they can understand the threat environment and the why of what we do things, you know, I think that that's where we failed in the security space as, as security pros is that we, we focus so much on what you need to do and not the why you need to do it. So um, have you, have you seen um, any issues with user adoption friction on that? Yeah. Area? You know, uh, and you know what the trend tends to be, unfortunately, that we really need to get through a lot of times the executives are guilty. Mm -hmm. You know, they are sometimes the hardest ones to convince that they'll actually be like, okay, enable MFA, but I don't want it. I yeah. don't want to deal with that. It's bad. I mean, they're not getting, you're right. They're not getting the why. We're not trying to inconvenience you. You know, you're the most important. You're the, you're a huge target. You're out there. You're on LinkedIn. Everyone knows you're the CEO. They're going to be targeting you. They're, they know you're going to have access to systems. And uh, oftentimes they're hard to convince. And that's the exact wrong thing to do because you're basically as the CEO saying, I think that it's inconvenient. I don't think it's worth it from a business perspective. And then that, yeah, that everything will just filter down from the top. So, well, I know that at least for me, um, being in IT and InfoSec and an entrepreneur um, is stressful and you can't, you can't be beholden to your your job 24 by 7. I like the fact that you took a few years off in order to explore other things. That's great. And but but now that you're you've been back in the game, if you will, for like the six or seven years or so, what do you do to separate yourself from the stresses of the uh, IT infosec entrepreneurship world? Uh well I think it'll be another thing we have in common. I love I love road biking. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I got a good story on that front. I, I'm so excited about this. I recently did my first multi-day ride ever just a few weeks ago. Really? In September. Yeah, it was a blast. I did a four-day, 225-mile ride starting in the Sequatchie Valley area, beautiful part of the state. It, it was a fully supported ride uh, uh, organized by Walk Bike Nashville. They you know, had trailers and everything. They, they drove us all out there. Um, and, and we set off from, from the starting point and we stayed at three different state parks. We stayed in cabins. So it was, uh, you know, it was, it was fully supported, very easy for us. Didn't have to carry anything. Um, so got to do this multi-day tour, uh, and it was, it was such a blast and, and, you know, get away. Uh, I think everyone in it, you know, everyone at our company does something. I mean, this is a good question because everyone does something and mm -hmm. it's gotta be something very far removed from technology. Um, it's funny. We have a lot of woodworkers. Um, uh, we have like three or four woodworkers in, in really? our office. We have a lot of runners, bikers, um, just something to get away. So yeah, absolutely. For me though. Yeah. Road biking, uh, just get on the road, zone out. It's a good place to be. And we've talked a little bit about indoor biking too with Zwift, right? You yeah, that? that's right. It's coming up. I know I'm, I was, I actually got out and rode yesterday because uh -huh. I was thinking about the, the the calendar and I'm like here when the clocks change yep. and, and the temperatures start going down, it's going to be Zwift for the next few months. So uh, I had a chance to go out biking yesterday. It's going to be one of the, the last times for the season, probably. Well, I think the last time we talked, I was very happy that I had made it to level 23 and you were like, yeah, yeah, that's good. I've been level 50 for about <laughs> two hey, years. Now they're now. 60. Now I've got more to do this winter. Oh, they're 60 now? I they, didn't know that. they raised the cap. Yeah, it's they're 60. So so what level are you at now? I, I am at 27. So okay. I, I, I got my Tron, which is the which is the concept yeah. bike, the real thing. Um, did a lot, a lot of climbing up uh, uh, the Alp. Um, and then, of course, by that point in time, it was springtime. I transitioned more to outdoors. I don't do as much outdoor road biking as, as I did before. I, I've been doing more running. And now I'm almost at the point of transitioning. I did a half marathon last uh, last weekend. I'm going to do another one um, in, in November, but I'm starting to transition back to the bike. So um, yeah, well, I don't know. I, I I don't know if to feel if I feel happy or sad that it's just like I thought I was 23 away from the top. Now I'm 33 away. I'm and of not course, even the, halfway there. yeah, they get harder and harder to obtain. Right. You know, the, the amount of biking you have to do to advance one level gets more and more. So well, that's I, that's how they suck you in. It's, yeah, it's just yeah. like, you know, we're just we going to move that carrot a little bit further. Yeah. And I think they released a new world. I mean, they always try to release something new. I think this this time of the, the season uh, to draw people in for that winter season. Uh, I saw some release about, but I actually haven't been on Zwift in, in a little while. Luckily, been outdoors. Uh, so uh, 
But yeah, I did the uh, I did the one, and I can't pronounce it. Begins with M, Mautuki Island or something like that, um, which I believe is in Japan. And yeah. it looked like that they, I mean, that world's been out for a while, but it just looked like that there were a lot more routes there and all that going through the city. Maybe they expanded it. Yeah, yeah they might have expanded it. So, um, future plans? You're you're going to do like maybe a, a week long biking event at some point in time, or I, you know, it was a blast. The thing I underestimated was the time I was going to need for training. So the last few weeks leading up to it, I actually had to begin taking time off from work to put in the miles to build up. Uh, now it paid off. It was great, but I was like really worried about, I don't want this to be miserable experience because I'm undertrained and I'm just cramping up and having an awful time. So I was really trying to like build up, you know, where I was ready for it. So it was tricky and building mm -hmm. up for a week long ride that that would be a challenge. So um I don't know. We'll see. I, I, I like the length of this. Uh, I know they even do a mini one where it's just a weekend, two day thing. Uh, it was a good experience, but uh, uh, I don't know. So I, I got to think about it because definitely now I do need to plan something else to have something to work for. I found myself very unmotivated now um, without that goal that was pushing me all year. So um, no, I totally thing. understand it. What about um, as far as professionally continue growing acumen? Professionally, yeah, I think Acumen's got a lot of room to grow and, and keep expanding and uh, helping more clients uh, with their security um, and with cloud in general. I mean, it's a very dynamic time in IT, which I mean, it always is. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I, but yeah. I mean, you know, moving to the cloud is a huge thing and and learning how to secure this new, you know, cloud infrastructure that doesn't have a defined perimeter you know it's not about the firewall anymore you know identity is this new perimeter and it, it's it's so tricky uh so it's a whole new a uh, whole new ball game so uh yeah it's it's fun I, I really love helping businesses make that transformation and get it secured so uh yeah that's that's the foreseeable future and and so much going on in that space if we get back to what we were just talking about with culture and from the top down where if you don't bring it from the top down, then you might have the uh, risk, if you will, of uh, business units going out for shadow IT, getting their own um, SaaS-based uh, solutions for for whatever it is they need to do. If security is just strictly no, 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 you can't do that. But uh, probably shadow IT is a conversation for another day. <laughs> we can well, talk about that for a long time. One thing on that, I really love, I want to share with you this analogy that this the, this gentleman from a, a healthcare company shared with me once. He said, stopping users from doing something is like trying to stop water from running downhill. You can't. Water will find its way downhill. The only thing you can do is direct it. So if you want users to do something, you've got to give them a tool, a means to do it the right way. Um, so, you know, just like you said, there's this friction between security and convenience. And we've got to find that right balance and make sure we don't have this shadow IT out there where the users are finding their own path. So uh, it, it's a good analogy. That's exactly what happens. And uh, yeah. That is an awesome analogy and a great way to end the podcast. So Keith, so much appreciate your time today. Always love talking with you. And uh, thank you for taking the time to come on with us today. Thanks again for having me, Greg. I had a great time. Appreciate it. All right, everybody stay secure.